And off we go. Perfect. Thanks, Charlotte. So uh, I'm, hi everyone, Matt Langley here. I am having two hats today. So one is that I'm a co-chair of the Scope 3 Sustainable Procurement Pledge. And the other one is I work for CBRE and Sustainable Procurement. And, and Alex and I are going to be presenting around a business case that we built the end of last year and thought it might be timely given a lot of us are starting to think through budgets for next year. And um, some of you might be interested in, in how to um, pull together a business case, what it looks like, uh, what the elements we put in. Um, we'll talk through what worked and what hasn't worked and some of the learnings over the last year. But yeah, any questions, just uh, uh, jump them in the chat or ask them as we go along. Might prefer to do that rather than save them all to the end. Um, so that's kind of a quick intro on myself. Alex, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be joining you today. So um, I head up our supplier sustainability team in CBRE, and my team has uh, two main focuses. It's uh, firstly, being able to demonstrate to our stakeholders the degree to which sustainable management practices are being deployed along our supply chain and our operations. And the second is very simply decarbonizing our supply chain. Um, which is a, a small sentence. And we're gonna tell you a little bit more about um, some of the challenges that we've overcome uh, or that we've yeah, noted along, along our journey so far. Um, my background is um, I've been an active supporter of the SBP personally uh, for some years before joining CBRE last year. Um, and um, I've worked in sourcing and procurement for over two decades um, and increasingly um, weaving in um, sustainability as a focus area into my work over the last six years. Perfect. So, so with something like this, it's not normal that you go from having nothing to, to then being able to build a business case around decarbonizing your supply chain. So, so at CBRE, the, the journey for us really started um, in 2018 when I got um, a global role um, focusing on uh, the procurement technology operations um, and data. Uh, so that was in 2018. And we added in uh, risk and um, transformation, and I added in ESG as part of that um, roadmap. And so I quietly just built it into the technology roadmap, the data roadmap. And, um, and so in 2019, we partnered with Ecovatis as an example. Um, we had the unfortunate incident of George Floyd. And, um, and so we had a supplier diversity program kind of be agreed at a global level and we started partnering with that. And so we really had sustainability and, and um, diversity, a supplier diversity working together. And then from a risk perspective, we also started building out um, the responsible procurement aspects around uh, um, the inherent risks in your supply chain. So really those different uh, projects working together, um, as well as we, we, we re-platformed to a procure-to-pay um, solution, Cooper, which helped on the data side, and we did a lot more around that, that data journey. Um, and not only data around our spend data, but also engaging around our suppliers. So understanding a lot more about our suppliers um, and the, the contacts within those. And you'll start to see that, that really this is a data journey as much as it is a supplier engagement journey. And that um, uh, they're really getting the basics around knowing your spend and knowing your suppliers, understanding how uh, services heavy or, or purchasing or products heavy it is. Um, and the, really, the better you can, you can um, have those types of early projects, the, the better you'll be set up with the foundations for, for further on. Um, so continue on the journey in about 20... 2020, end of 2020, we, um, CBRE brought in BCG. Um, our global board wanted CBRE to be more of a sustainability leader in the real estate space. Um, and so there was a consulting engagement around sustainability. 
Um, at the same time, we, we had a consulting engagement with BCG around procurement, and I sort of pushed those two together to, to show that there, there is a sustainable procurement um, uh, area that we needed to work on. And so, you know, BCG took the original business cases and, um, uh, you know, the request that we had developed a couple of years ago, um, made it look nice, put their logo on it and then gave it back to our senior leaders who were like, all right, this is new, this is great. Um, and so, so then from that, a global work stream was set up um, around a green and diverse supply chain. And so that was really in um, uh, 2021 that that started. Uh, and with that also, I found that that was sort of working through and yes, with a CPO, but it felt a bit like middle management. And so um, given that this had gone to the board, I pushed that there was a steering committee meeting um, with one of the COOs, one of our CEOs, the chief responsibility officer and all the procurement leadership. Um, and so every month we kind of present back around what we've done on this green and diverse um, supply chain work stream. And so, so that really led <clears throat> To us coming up with a plan around, well, uh, from a green perspective, it's really around environmental, and from environmental, it's really about um, decarbonizing the supply chain and um, circular economy, and that's really where this um, business case really started coming in. Um, so, so that's kind of the journey that got us to the end of last year, where we had really got a good view around what do we need, what should it look like, what partners do we do we need to bring in. Um, what do we need to do? Um, what are the benefits? And and that enabled us to put this business case together. <laughs> so really started with um, we're sort of following what what Alex had um, found uh, on the Gardner um, uh, best practice around building a, a business case, and and they start with well, what's the issue. And um, you know what's the problem you're trying to solve? Why are we trying to change? You know why now? And so um, we didn't really use the structure when we built the business case, but we're finding it useful um, in the way to present it to you today um, because it kind of fits with with what we ended up doing. Alex, do you want to? This was your slide to jump into, right? Sure. Yeah, so this is one of our one of our busier slides with with a little bit of data. Um, but what we're looking at here effectively is some of the analysis that led us to um, set the foundations basically for the the business case uh, structure that we're um, going to be talking about today. And basically, you know, going back to those three questions: what's the problem? Why now? And and uh, why do we need to change? Um, well, the problem is we need to decarbonize our supply chain, and we need to go as quickly as possible to meet our net zero commitments. And what you're seeing here is three lines, three glide paths that show kind of three different scenarios in terms of why do we need to change? Um, so the lowest line that you're looking at there is like a theoretical perfect net zero glide path by having our emissions by 2050 and um, meeting 90% uh, abatement by, by 2040, sorry, excuse me, 2030 and then 2040 because um, those are the commitments that CBRE made. And then the other scenarios that are there in terms of the lines are, um, you know, the, the the impact that we would have uh, by applying different different levels of resources and different speed, if you will, um, to that decarbonization uh, uh, path. And so, effectively, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to minimize the area under the curve as quickly as possible, um, in terms of of those lines. And in order to do that, what we um, analyzed was that there's uh, a tr uh, a rate at which we need to engage a certain critical mass of suppliers in, in order to be able to, um, you know, go along um, the most optimal glide path um, ahead of us. And based on, on some of the analysis um, that we pulled together um, at the time that we were pulling the business case information was um, amongst the 130 plus thousand suppliers that CBRE works with, there's probably 7,500 that are the most material. Um, and uh, while that seems like a small proportion of our overall supply chain, that 7,500 is a huge number compared to most um, organizations in terms of their supply chain engagement. Um, and so, you know, why, why do we need to change and why now? And those, that whole, those, those answers become much more obvious when we understand all of those 
uh, points that I was just talking to is that we need to engage at scale quickly um, with a lot of suppliers and, uh, and bring them up to speed in order to be in, uh, in any position to be in, in uh, to enable um, a supply chain decarbonization journey. And that's why you know, we start seeing how that data journey and the supplier engagement journey um, starts to come to life. The, 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 those two elements that, that Matt um, has been talking us through so far. Um, so th this is in terms of, you know, the basic um, high level picture, I guess you could say that um, has driven a lot of our, uh, uh, our talking points with our stakeholders um, around the organization. And if we go to um, maybe the next slide, what we can um, see. Sorry, Alex, can I, can I just jump in here? Because um, I want to add a couple of extra. Sure, points. go ahead. So, um, so one is around, um, you know, identifying the number of suppliers. 7,500 is a large number. We haven't come across any other company that, that's had that many. Um, if you look at the program Snyder Electrics put together, they talk about 1,015. Um, then, you know, Apple has about um, 300 suppliers they're engaging with. Most companies are about two to 300, sometimes up to 1,000. Um, so, so that's um, a lot more. And I talked before around how we spent a bit of time getting our spend data right. And then we played around with emission factors um, because there isn't a spend to emission factor one-to-one. -one. Depends on the industry and uh, what the supplier is performing for you. And so there are separate sessions within the uh, SPP scope three where we've really gone into the detail around the data, the emission factors, and how you can kind of come up with these numbers. Um, but my final point to me, this is my Everest slide that um, when we put this together, it was like the clouds parted and I looked at Everest and then I looked mm -hmm. at what do we need to do? And it's not that we were in base camp looking up at Everest. I didn't even think that we were really in Kathmandu. We were kind of at home thinking like, oh, this might be another great idea. What, what should we pack? Um, because you look at just what you need to do and actually the timelines so were... Initially, I was like, well, you know, CBR is net, net zero 2040. That's 17 years away and we're all good. That's a long time. I'll probably be retired by then. You need to worry about it. But then, you know, we break down to 2030 commitments and then um, uh, how long it takes suppliers to, to decarbonize. And suddenly it becomes super real um, and what you need to do today. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to add that. Yep, absolutely. Um, yeah, so this is, I mean, a view of, of, of our business internally, the colors basically on, on the different pies um, talk to different lines of business or different ways of splitting our business across um, uh, internally. But basically the story that we brought to life was um, to our stakeholders uh, was, look, we have almost 10 million tons of emissions sitting in our um, supply chain. 90% um, of that is about 9 million tons of emissions. Um, that maps to about 7,500 material suppliers. And if we're able to address um, those 90% of those emissions, we're also going to be, if you will, affecting about 47% of, of our spend. It's about half of our spend in terms of the orders of magnitude. Um, and those, those relationships are um, directly related to about 7,000 of our client relationships um, on a day-to-day on -day basis. So just, the, the the picture that we're trying to drive here is that it is um, across the board transformational. We can't do um, you know a net zero decarbonization project or a supply chain decarbonization project just by focusing on a subset of you know particular um, clients or a subset of particular suppliers. We really have to be thinking about um, it as as broadly as as, as possible um, across the business. And so um, that's a uh, bringing that those types of orders of magnitude up to the Steer code that Matt was talking about before um, are uh, were important elements in in bringing to life the why change why now questions that we were talking about before. Um, and so, yeah, one of the next um, questions that we were grappling with was, you know, what's the benefit um, that we want to make sure that we're um, conveying from a from a business perspective. And uh, you know why potentially is this more valuable than than, than other opportunities? And so um, I think the next slide that we have here, Matt, is one that uh, that you wanted to talk to in terms of how we pull together different 
levers of benefit to um, illuminate that storyline for stakeholders. Sorry, I was trying to answer one of the questions. Um, yeah, this one is an interesting one. So what comes out with business cases I find is that the costs are super clear. You know, this is what I need from the technology, operation, process changes, um, people, and, uh, and that's all very uh, black and white. The benefits are often a bit uh, fuzzy. And so we did spend quite a bit of time thinking through what are the benefits? Yes, we'll be able to um, help ourselves meet our net zero commitments. We'll help our clients meet our net zero, and their net zero commitments because we're a B2B provider and um, there's reputation and, and a bunch of other things. But what really are um, uh, the, the benefits that we'll be able to do this? And so, um, so really we kind of said, well, one of them would be an internal um, cost of carbon. Um, and, and what would that price be? And so we said, well, if we um, are at 10 million tons now, this program um, works as it should, then um, you know, we'll be to 5 million tons by 2030. What does that represent by an internal carbon price? Um, and so, um, we then used reference, um, Alex, you found the uh, SPP, sorry, no, um, CDP um, had done a report around scope three and it was between like $19 and, and $49. So we took the lower end of that and said, okay, well, what, what would be, um, that could be one benefit. Um, and so really looking through um, wouldn't mean, would mean we wouldn't need to offset. It would mean that we wouldn't need to report as much for regulations. Um, and it would mean that if they, um, certain areas of our organization um, were caught up by the carbon trading schemes in New York and California and, um, and in Europe and um, parts of Asia, then we wouldn't need to, to pay nearly as much. So, so that was one area and we, we uh, calculated a return on investment um, for that and that came out as, um, as, as pretty positive. We said, okay, well, that's one way of looking at this. What about another way? Another way could be that um, the partnership we choose um, with the, the provider to help our suppliers um, go and decarbonize um, will engage with a significant amount of our supply chain. And so we will um, give them not only the contacts, but we'll build it out with them uh, because they're, they're an early stage startup. Um, you know, the approaches that have worked for us to engage with suppliers, um, this was a new request, the way that we, um, uh, the way that we work with that partner. And so it's, um, uh, they build a product, product around that. Um, and so what if we, uh, do something that CBRE really doesn't do, but do a strategic investment um, uh, in that supplier and what could be the return um, from that over a certain um, period. Um, because we'd run an RF, we've done market analysis, run an RFP, and we're down to um, doing proof of concepts and things. And so we saw that, you know, we are really leading in this and, and this might be a good investment for us to um, uh, do. And we'll learn a lot as well through that strategic investment. Um, and that had a great payback as well. And then finally, um, we said, okay, well, what about the revenue um, that this is going to generate? And um, the, the way that this approach um, we've, we've done um, with our partner and with our net zero supply chain is that we are able to provide our clients transparency in the supply chain um, so they can see um, us as their tier one, but then our tier one suppliers, so their tier two and, and tier three and, and on. So we can provide transparency in the supply chain. We have um, much clearer um, carbon reporting. So we get the primary or actual emission data from our suppliers um, and the approach that we take. And then providing that transparency and that, that measurability, um, we can allow our clients to influence the um, uh, the, the products and services that we buy on their behalf. And, um, and so we give all of that. And so that um, is a differentiator in, in the real estate industry. Um, and so there's some revenue attached to that. And I think we put in like 1% or something from where Alex is super small amount um, of revenue growth. 
um, and then we, um, but then if, if that um, client then wants to move to a competitor of ours, then they lose all that transparency and ability to influence. Um, so we're able to tie it to, to revenue. Um, we also had other aspects um, that we can provide some consulting engagements um, around that. We can provide um, referrals um, to our partner that, that we've chosen and um, uh, and then we'll, we kind of identified a couple of other revenue areas. So, so we looked at these and we looked at the different return on investments and um, we kind of said, well, each of them alone actually stands up. Um, but by bringing um, three of them and, and building three into the reporting of uh, the business case, then means that um, it sort of makes this feel a lot more real from a benefits perspective. Yes, the, the cost is super clear, black and white, but the benefits, you could discount one of these, but you can't discount all three. Alex, anything else you want to add to that? No, I think that, yeah, um, the, the, the fact that we were able to, um, yeah, really look at each case individually and then pulling together those three cases together really helped us to, yeah, drive that conversation internally um, and, and show that we've been creative in, in, in thinking about things and bringing, bringing those different angles in um, and demonstrating the value across the board. So obviously one of the main questions that um, came up internally is, well, this all seems maybe like a, a good plan, uh, but how much is it going to cost? And you know, what kind of resources um, are, are we going to need to carry this off? And so um, what we did is we tried, we, we looked at, uh, we looked at the big picture. We looked at, uh, you know, from a sustainable procurement aspects, uh, you know, really strategically. So we identified four key uh, focus areas from a strategic perspective and mapped really clearly, you know, programmatic elements and, and specific actions that we would be taking and, and, and then tie a specific financial impact, either um, a cost avoidance or a revenue generation, um, you know, number to each one of those uh, specific activities. And then we're able to total that up. Um, did you want to add some, some comments here, Matt? No, I, I think, well, a key one would be that that we really thought through the different elements um, that we would require and um, and sort of built it through. And, and you can see design for circular, uh, circularity and, and zero waste. And that was actually looking a bit further ahead in our mind that as some of our clients have um, net, well, sorry, waste goals around um, waste to landfill and and so focus on that. A, a lot don't. Um, but what we see is that when carbon starts having a value uh, and you own, um, you know, furniture or um, you've got a fit out in a building, if you just pick all of that and throw it to landfill, it's not only lost um, cost in doing that, and a lot of companies have already, uh, from a financial perspective, have already written these off anyway, um, but you lose the carbon with that too. And so when you buy something new, you're buying a new product and you're buying the carbon that goes along with that too. Um, and so if you're able to um, repair or, or reuse some of your um, fit out and, and furniture um, in our world, then you would um, not only save some money, but you'd save that, that carbon emissions as well. So we're kind of just thinking through what only do we need to solve for now, but but what are some of the other things that will come up and be important too? Yeah, and how they all kind of interact with each other. Yeah. Um. So yeah, and then we we basically are 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 in a position now to talk to you about you know the the steps that we think are necessary for success and some of the pitfalls um, uh, to be avoided. Um, so you know, obviously we're talking about you know implementation over the next couple of years um, and um, some of the early learnings that we've already been able to to generate from um, going down this path um, with our supply chain partners uh, to date. Um, so on on the left hand side is is uh, um, a graph that uh, actually talks to some of the key messages that we 
we were covering earlier today, but what we're the, the key message that we're driving here is juxtaposing or basically highlighting that journey with um, supplier maturity information um, on the side as well. So just really reiterating that um, it is uh, uh, a journey where we have to support our suppliers and their capabilities, as well as being able to collect reliably, um, you know, that data to be able to generate tr that, that trend um, over time. So um, it's uh, again, um, you know, reminding ourselves that we have to balance the sustainability, the supplier engagement journey with the data collection journey um, as we move forward. And what's really interesting actually is that um, the supplier, if you will, maturity statistics that are on the right-hand side of the screen were um, pulled together by the Ecovatis and the CDP a couple of years ago. And through the engagement that we've had with um, our suppliers so far, um, we've been able to confirm that, you know, uh, two thirds of them still do need support um, and, and capability building when it comes to being able to, to take the next step along the sustainability journey. So even though it's figures that come from a couple of years ago, we're, we're seeing that that trend uh, is continuing. And so that's why that plateau on the left-hand side graph is really, really significant because it signals that um, even though we started engaging at scale with several hundred suppliers already, we know that we're gonna have a period of time where progress is going to be really slow. Um, and that's why that early engagement is so important um, uh, along this program. Anything else you wanna add on, on that one, Matt? Yeah, it's not only what we've found, we've also found like Schneider Electric, uh, Christoph has confirmed that he's got the similar numbers as well um, in their program when they started in, uh, I think about two years ago. So that, that does seem to be consistent. <laughs> and that should be built into your business case. It's a key one that, that you're going to have to not just say to your suppliers, you know, register with CDP or Ecovatis and, and get an SBTI, but you're actually going to help them uh, or need to help them calculate their emissions uh, because they won't be able to. Or if, if they do, then um, you may not trust that data, especially in the scope three, because there's so many variations. Um, with that. So, so you need to kind of make sure that you're getting the right solutions in place too. Yep, absolutely. Um, so this is kind of like a, a, a historical view, of re repeating some of the key elements that Matt has already talked us through in terms of the journey, um, you know, starting off with establishing the function and having that guidance from consultancy and then basically working our way through the market and proof of concepting if you can say that as a verb, with uh, three different companies and, and setting up our, um, our carbon trace program today. And so um, basically we've talked to you about engaging with um, 7,500 suppliers over the next three years. Um, we're on track to engage with over a thousand suppliers in 23. We're gonna be um, more than doubling that next year. And then again, doubling that, just about doubling that the year after. So we're scaling up very, very quickly. Um, and um, as we're doing that, we're also thinking ahead um, about you know how are we going to be ensuring that we've got visibility of um, our supplier decarbonization initiatives and actively managing those. Um, and so yeah, it's this is a, a you know a marathon view of of uh, the next you know six and a half years. What's going to keep um, you know supply chain professionals that are embarking on supply chain decarbonization programs? This is the kind of of focus. Um, that that is 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 going to be part of the of your day to day over the next you know decade effectively. Yeah, and we get um, we get a few questions from leadership around. Well, can you show the decarbonizing that we'll be doing this year? <laughs> Which we we sort of go back and say, well, there's a lot of elements that we need to build in the program to be able to do that. Um, but what we're finding is that just getting more accurate data is we're getting quite a nice tailwind. Um, uh, to kind of help us, but we, we do see that we need to be decarbonizing um, with our suppliers as quickly as we can. Um, and we we are finding that that as we engage with the suppliers, there are some that are already doing it. Um, we haven't kind of validated if they're good or not. We need to see their 2023 numbers versus their 2022 numbers to, to kind of see what that is. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a journey. It's a, as we said at the start, it's a data journey and it's a supplier engagement journey that, that you need to go on. Oh, sorry. 
Uh, Alex, I think I had this one, right? Um, so, so we put this together a while ago and, uh, and we've kind of made it a bit more complicated as we've gone through, but wanted to go back. So it's, it's a bit of a simpler thing um, and easier to communicate. So, so really the strategy we had a long while ago has four pillars in it. Um, so we have um, at the top, I can't do a, a little um, thing. Um, we've got, you know, Alex running the strategy and overall program uh, management. Uh, we we need to deploy um, Ecovartis to more suppliers. Uh, and so, so we want a dedicated resource that's working with our sourcing and um, purchasing communities um, to really help drive that through. Um, and, and there's a lot of supplier engagement that, that needs to happen. There's a cost associated with Ecovartis. Um, it's less than if you try and get them to do a CDP and SBTI. Um, it's a lot less, but like uh, there's still um, an amount they need to pay. And in some ways, um, it's a test as well for, for some of our suppliers that if you're not willing to spend 500 to, to 2,000 to register with, with EcoVartis and go through this process, are you really willing to spend the, the amounts needed to, uh, to decarbonize yourself and your supply chain? Um, and then in the middle, we've talked a bit about that, our project Carbon Trace, um, and that's really our partnership with, with EmitWise to reach out to our suppliers to calculate their emissions and really go through that, um, uh, that measurability in that process. Um, we need to um, have a pillar around our internal engagement and client engagement. So between the, the team, we're probably at least doing a, a client call every, every week, um, all of us, sometimes more, to kind of talk our clients through our approach because I've got their different views. Uh, and in some ways, by getting in early on this, we're, we're able to change some of their thinking the, to align with us so, so we're not having to get a huge number of different um, questionnaires or, or elements we need to work with. Um, but also we need to get an internal engagement and um, that can be quite quite difficult as well um, because we've got a thousand procurement people and we've got 30 or 40,000 people that are all purchasing at the moment. Um, so we need to le leverage the procure to pay technology with Cooper and identifying diverse and supply or have diverse and sustainable suppliers um, registered in there. Um, but also to kind of explain um, pretty difficult concepts in, in easier ways. So, you know, we've been partnering with the Supply Chain Sustainability School for a while and using their training courses. Um, and now we're kind of developing our own ones as we um, develop our, our own net zero supply chain product. So that's a key pillar around that internal and external engagement. Um, and finally, one that, that um, we've, We've really been working um, a little bit on this year, but need to do a lot more is around the supply outreach program. So, so with um, Project Carbon Trace um, and EcoVartis and uh, the sustainability assessment, we can get an idea of the maturity of our suppliers and where their emissions are. If they're a cleaner, it might be 50% in scope one and two um, and 50% in scope three purchasing. Um, so, you know, please use electric vehicles, um, please use renewable energy sources, um, and the chemicals you use can use on-site ionization. Um, and so, you know, 70 to 80% decarbonizing um, there. And if they're a mature supplier, it's quite an easy discussion. Um, but then you've got the other extreme, if it's a, um, uh, if it's a repairs and maintenance supplier, that's maybe, um, repairing a HVAC or an air conditioning unit, um, they may have 95 to 97% of their emissions are in their supply chain um, in scope three. And so if they're low maturity, then that's a much different conversation and we need to help them with green funding and tech stacks and um, a lot of education and um, industry standard settings. So, so we're really trying to do quite a lot there. And then those pillars, need to be working together in a synergy like um, environment and that field needs to feed through also to our um, sales and solutions teams and our engagements there and our delivery teams that we have the technology engagements we need to do 
So it really comes down to clients seeing it and the benefits similar to our suppliers and um, and to CBRE. So then it becomes visible. Uh, but there's a there's a lot of um, uh, engagements and work that needs to happen for for it to become visible um, for those different groups. Alex, this was your one. Sure. So <clears throat> we were talking about building a business case for decarbonizing your supply chain um, today, and so we have already engaged with several hundred suppliers, as I said. And um, this is kind of like, you know, six points that we've learned um, over, you know, a couple hundred supplier engagements over the last, uh, you know, 12 to 18 months. Um, one of the key uh, value adds that this, this process and this uh, journey, if you will, is, is driving for Seabury and for its clients is our ability to decouple basically emissions growth from business growth. Um, and more downstream our value chain. So when we're engaging with, um, with our clients, um, it brings to, to, to life basically um, the value of this upstream supply chain um, engagement. Um, and that's a message that we found is, is resonating very, uh, very strongly um, down, you know, downstream our value chain. Um, uh, it is the, the second key learning is around um, being able to obtain that uh, sub tier in your supply chain emissions transparency, um, it, it we believe that it's the key to unlocking um, really that scope three change rapidly because we're all now uh, when we say we're all uh, so we see it be as as a as a as a client to our suppliers and our suppliers uh, working with us have this share the same data. Um, and we can have, you know, productive and value added conversations around the same data. There's, there's the hotspots are clear, the prioritization is clear, and we can focus on um, driving those decarbonization um, initiatives. The third piece that um, has, has really uh, shown out at us over the last um, little while is around data quality. Um, I think, you know, anybody who's paying attention to sustainability legislation is um, is is aware that third party verification is is becoming um, um, important and auditability of data is, is becoming um, key. Um, and uh, the approach that we've taken bringing a standardized methodology and a data quality score, if you will, to our supply chain uh, data is extremely valuable again when we're having these conversations with other stakeholders along the value chain. The fourth piece is one that um, uh, is particularly important to, um, you know, I, I guess, I guess the procurement community, the supply chain community as well. So anybody who's getting their head around, I guess, emissions um, measurement and management uh, for the first time is that there is some volatility, if you will, in in um, inventory numbers or baseline figures, depending on what stage you are in 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 your journey, and um, our fundamental uh, belief is that that volatility is not a bad thing. It is actually a good thing. The more you refine the data that you have, the more that you work through um, improving your methodology and standardizing your methodology, you will uncover um, as, gen as a general rule, uh, uh, a trend towards you know, more precision, but there will be some outliers out there that will give you good indication that you know, this is um, a hotspot or a priority that you didn't know about before and that you do need to focus on now. And so, you know, the fact that um, that overall supply chain baseline or that scope three baseline may change is, is not necessarily um, a, a bad thing. Um, the fifth piece that we wanted to get um, a, a across today is that um, one of the main drivers why yeah. we've, sorry, does somebody have a question? No. Okay, one of the main drivers that um, that pushed us to to bring this uh, this method to our supply chain is that we realized that, you know, there is programs out there, excuse me, there are programs out there that are like, you know, publicly disclosing emissions information, but that's only the tip of the iceberg and, and giving us a really limited view of what our suppliers are actually working on, because when we've engaged with them much more intimately, we've uncovered that almost a third of our suppliers are thinking about or have already implemented um, some decarbonization initiatives. And so, you know, you, we really do need to have that 
um, supplier engagement journey activated in order to get the value of that information. Um, and then the last piece is, is around, you know, um, some, some organizations are taking the view that, you know, we're, we're going to try to uh, collaborate with, with our value chain on a voluntary basis. And that is, uh, uh, you know, one of the ways of doing it. Um, and, and I think a helpful way to, to start. Um, and what we're seeing is that that voluntary engagement is only going to get us so far. Um, you know, we've been talking about um, that number of, you know, 7,500 suppliers over the next three years. We're starting to see that there are there's a, a proportion of of those suppliers which will be um, uh, difficult to reach in terms of enabling that conversation and making sure that they're receiving the messages um, around the fact that you know we're coming to them with not only an ask for more data but also um, an offer of, of capability building um, and so you know being a little bit you know slicker with um, some some KPIs around uh, commercial uh, you know points between um, ourselves and our suppliers. I think will will help to um, address that gap um, you know over the next couple of years. So I think those are the kind of like yeah key learnings that that we could um, share today um, after having gone through gone through this process. There have been a couple of questions in the chat, which I think we have gotten to most of them. Uh, Alex, let me just I just want to add a comment, um, and then we can go to the questions. So I think that the um, the last point I've had questions from senior leadership around: Well, can't we just rely on the countries and their net zero commitments um, and plans? Mm. And uh, my answer was: Well, you can, but one, they're on a different time time horizon. I mean, most countries are twenty fifty, India is twenty seventy. Uh, was China's 2060 um, and so and we're 2040 so that kind of doesn't help that much um, and so so we need to go faster than than a number of the other countries um, are looking to do <clears throat> and then the other comment I want to make around re-baselining it's took me about a week to get my head around it I mean I, I'm a procurement person that likes to know well this is my spend this is my uh, reduction percentage I need to to do every year and so that's my um, performance goal is I say, you know, 100 million or, or whatever the amount is. Um, and it, it really did take me a, a week to kind of say, but everyone talks about their baseline year and how they're trying to reduce from that. What, what do you mean that that baseline is going to be um, changing every time you get a bit emission factor, you, you have different um, suppliers in your supply chain, your suppliers give you more um, detailed information. You know that baseline is really going to be shifting the whole time, um, and and can be shifting quite significantly when you change emission factors that that you use. Uh, but uh, what helped me was that the the end state of the net zero is something that you can aim for, um, and so you know how do you kind of get to to that end state um, and just let the baseline kind of go as it, as it does and um, becomes more clearer. Um, as you learn more and um, and then you know hopefully it, it um, tracks down so that the the other aspect um, that we found with this is around decoupling the emission factors at a average industry level uh, multiplied by spend versus the primary data or the actual emission data we're trying to get from our suppliers because if you just rely on the standard emission factors um, as you spend more your emission goes up so you might spend more on a more sustainable product and your emissions will go up if you're using averages. So you need to be able to get down to the actual emissions. Um, as Alex was talking about the first one, decoupling emission growth from business growth. And so, you know, that is really um, what we've had to develop and, and drive through here to able to, um, to meet our commitments and, and have that um, drucker quote of what gets measured gets managed. Um, and so... Yeah, so a lot of work and um, a lot of interesting results. Um, yeah, let me stop that and see what questions we've got. Alex, we'll there, oh, we've had another one around, um, how did you define your baseline? So um, yeah, that's been an interesting process. So uh, what we did was uh, we spent, you know, 2018 um, and 2019, getting our spend, um, the name normalization, the spend categorization as good as we could. 
And then um, we started playing around with the mission factors. So um, we'd done some, um, we'd put some numbers into the corporate responsibility report. And so we had emission factors provided to us by the consultants um, for the US EPA, EIO, um, environmental something input output. Um, and, and so we started with that, which got us to about um, 8 million tons in our supply chain. Um, but we didn't like that they um, were at a global level, primarily US focused. Um, and so we moved across to another one called the WIOD, the Worldwide Input Output Database. Um, and that moved us up to 10 million tons. Um, and now we're using the XCO base um, emission factors through EmitWise that brings it down to a transaction level. Um, and if you strip out our scope one and two, emissions that are in our supply chain, I think we're about 6.7 million tons. Um, and so we kind of went on a whole data journey around the baseline. I don't, in some ways, whether it's 10 million or 6.7 million tons, it's still millions of tons. And, um, and so we, uh, I think the key here is that you, you choose an emission factor, um, you kind of publicize it, and, um, uh, and you kind of start from there. And we ran a session last month with the SPP Scope 3 um, with Climatic, um, and they have a free tool that will help get you some emission factors that you can look to utilize. And, and Luke was on that um, session as well. I think that's a great one to go and um, help you just start off like, okay, I've got my spin cube, now what do I do? Um, that session is quite useful in explaining what the next steps are. <laughs> Uh, Alex, any others that you've you're replying to some of them? Yeah, um, there's a question uh, which is always a little sensitive around costs. Sarah, could you just clarify um, what what you're asking for? Because there's there's two aspects when we're talking about a supply chain program, right? So there's the cost of what does it cost CBRE to set up this program? And there's the cost of what does a supplier have to pay to participate in the program? What are you looking yeah, for? Yeah, um, I mean, I want to know uh, how much um, costs for you as a company uh, to have all of this data, I mean, to start this journey with the supplier engagement, but also on the other side, how much is the fee for the supplier? I mean, for Ecovadis, I think there is a fee for them, but they, then they have also additional fee for this part uh, emission calculation, I think, or... Yeah, so at a high level, so... Um, you know, the supply chain engagement programs uh, that are based on a platform of information will all kind of take the same kind of approach, right? It'll be a software as a service, yeah. corporate license fee mm -hmm. number, right? Um, and I'm sure you're familiar with those numbers. So, yeah. um, you know, that, that, that can be something that can obviously be tailored to, to your organization specifically if you reach out to the providers directly. But um, uh, to, to talk about the uh, engagement fee with uh, from a supplier perspective, so there are different models that are out there. Indeed, um, Ecovadis does charge uh, a nominal fee for suppliers to get um, assessed. Um, however, when we talk to our suppliers around the Ecovadis program, we're in short, we make sure that we underline the fact that it's a, it's a co-funded uh, program. So we do pay an enterprise fee to, um, to Ecovadis to ensure that we have access to the platform and all our users can get into mm -hmm. the platform and everything. Um, and what we're, what um, Ecovadis made the decision of doing a few years ago is they used to offer this assessment free of charge, and they realized that what is free sometimes is perceived as having no value or limited value. So that's why they started charging a couple hundred dollars to maximum a couple thousand dollars, depending on the market and the size of the company, for the tailored assessment that the company is receiving. Um, you know, in, in, in large multinational companies, there's many different, you know, compliance programs that are being rolled out. And sometimes they do have a fee and sometimes they don't. And so we took the, the decision for um, our carbon trace program to not uh, charge our suppliers anything. And so it is a completely free of charge possibility okay. for them to build their um, capabilities. And it's mainly because um, we wanted to accelerate as quickly as possible that visibility to um, you know really granular level supply chain information. Um, now, I've just told you the story about Ecovadis and the perception of value, and I'm telling you that we're doing it free of charge. So it's kind of like, you know, 
what is the right answer? Um, I don't think we have, you know, a magical silver bullet answer, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're able to talk to um, the reasons why certain programs are set up in the way that they are in certain certain are free for the supplier and certain certain um, aspects of them are, are there is a cost associated okay uh, thanks we did find in the the last results that we did we went out to 325 suppliers um, 98 went through the process um, 54 of them i think that we improved their um, uh, their calculations um, in scope one and two, and 17% of that we actually calculated for the first time. And then 80% of the um, suppliers we calculated their scope three for the first time. Um, so, so going back to that slide that Alex had around, um, you know, what was the research and what did we find? Um, yeah, we, we do get some nice comments back from suppliers, which isn't always... Um, normal when you're rolling out something to them that they need to do some some work and often get pushed back um but the appreciation that we're not asking them to fill in a hundred question uh esg questionnaire um <clears throat> that it's it's only a couple of questions and then they load up their spin cube and and they get the results back um so it's a lot less for them um if they have that available um and so and then we come back and we show them the results sometimes for the first time that they're, they're seeing that. So uh, it's a, we're, we're trying to help them um, and some of them are picking it up um, and some more will need to do more engagement. Now, I just want to sort of take the opportunity to, to, to kind of clarify some of the, the questions that Marjolene was, was raising around, you know, so what are we collecting and what are we reporting? And what are we baselining? So um, our, the you know when when CBRE is thinking about their supply chain emissions, we're on our corporate responsibility report filling in the line, if you will, of CBRE's scope three point one and three point two, right? So we we've kind of like many companies put those two together, um, and our supply chain emissions get reported at that level, right? But when we engage with our suppliers, Marjolene, we're asking them about their entire emissions. So we're asking about their scope one, their scope two, their scope three, so that we can then distill. Um, uh, that information and, and focus on, um, uh, you know, the, the most viable options, if you will, or the, the most obvious hotspots of emissions for that particular supplier. Um, so it does get confusing because our scope 3.1 is there, all of their scope, you know, it, 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 it is um, the nature of uh, indirect emissions is that you know another party is directly contributing to to align on 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 your inventory um you know but um yeah just wanted to clarify that that we are asking them about everything but then that translates to only two lines in our um overall reporting if that makes sense yeah and the follow-up question is yeah the 50 percent reduction by 2030 is for cbre scope one two and three mm -hmm. Um, and and just to add complexity for Alex, we're actually for the suppliers we asked for their scope three upstream. So um, I don't know if people have much knowledge about scope three, but it's helpfully the everything else bucket, and it's got fifteen different areas. Um, and the prime, the largest ones are really the purchasing, which is an upstream, as well as like um, some logistics and travel and other things. And then the downstream is like your use of products. And so if you ask for your supplier's use of products, um, you'll in effect double count because in our CBRE's use of products, it includes our clients' buildings and their emissions from our clients' buildings, which they should already be counting. Um, and so, yeah, you, you have to be a little bit careful what you're asking for, otherwise you can get a lot higher emissions than, than are really there. Um, but it also means that um, hopefully you're kind of realizing that you do need to upskill yourself a bit on this and you do need partners that can help you. Otherwise, it um, uh, can get quite confusing and you've got some things where you need to debate with, with people who, who understand this to kind of see what, what needs, uh, what, what's required in your situation. Any other questions or comments?
Okay, great. Well, um, happy that you reach out or there's, there is a the scope three, uh, SVP scope three LinkedIn. You can post some questions there. We, we look at that every once in a while. Uh, otherwise, thank you very much for attending and um, hope you found this useful. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Alexandra. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, brilliant. Thank, thank you. you very much.